Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ali Nassardo, Senior Association Manager of PPRA. Thank you for joining us today for the roadresource.org webinar, stretching bu budgets further, especially now. We do have you all on mute for the webinar and we'll be using the question function for any questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. A brief introduction before we begin. Lindsay Matouche is President and CEO and Grace Sansbury is an Account Executive at Vario Consulting, the marketing firm that has partnered with PPRA to create roadresource.org. Over the course of the year, um, they will present a series of webinars on roadresource.org. Uh, we also have John Livesey, town engineer for the town of Lexington, Massachusetts, who will be assisting on today's call. We will now turn it over to Lindsay and Grace um, for the webinar. Good morning, everyone. We are, uh, or good afternoon for most of you. We are thrilled to be here today and uh, to have an hour of your time. So we wanted to start uh, next by uh, a simple um, thank you. Uh, there's your lovely panelists. Um, by a simple thank you. We know that uh, there's a lot of talk. Um, there's a lot of thank you deserved by frontline workers. And we know that you guys are on the front lines all the time, uh, taking care of what is for most communities their uh, most valuable asset and an asset that we frequently take for granted. So as a taxpayer and as someone who has been living in this industry for the last six years, uh, we wanted to start our team by simply saying thank you. And as we gave thought to what we could do with this time and how we could add value to you when you are probably as busy as ever and dealing with tremendous amounts of uncertainty, uh, we, we started listening for what are the biggest pressures you're facing and what sort of pressures might we able to address today or um, or explore a little bit. So we've heard quite a bit from you guys about the uncertainty pertaining to funding. We've heard everything from I'm facing serious budget cuts and they're freezing spending, they're halting projects, our revenues down, um, essential, non-essential business. Uh, we know there's a lot of uncertainty about funding and funding levels in the short term. Uh, in the midterm, also looking at next year, the year after that, as people anticipate decreases in revenue. Um, so we hear this tremendous uncertainty around having enough money to address the needs of your network. We also hear this other vein of thought around expedited projects or uh, potential stimulus dollars that may or may not be coming down the pike and may or may not affect your particular agency if they do, um, as well as pressure from the public saying, hey, fix the roads while we're in. So we know uh, the short story is you guys have a lot of pressure and a lot of uncertainty. Um, and that says, leaves us with kind of two key questions. One, uh, with increased budget demands on any community and community saying, if our tax dollars are down, what dollars go where? How do you make the case for roads? And two, whether you have significantly less dollars or end up with more money due to stimulus, how do you put every dollar to use most effectively? How do you make every dollar work as hard as you possibly can? We know that many of you will be looking at less. Um, and even if you're looking at more, how do you make that work for you? So uh, very briefly, here's who, who uh, PPRA is, who's speaking to you. If you haven't been on a webinar with us before, uh, it's a joint effort by the three associations, the Asphalt Emulsion Manufacturers Association, the International Slurry and Surfacing Association, and the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association. And they came together and said, you know, we need to make it easier for agencies who are trying to figure out how do we stretch budgets further? How do we make the most of our networks? So they formed the PPRA, the Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance. And the PPRA has one real goal. And that goal is to empower agencies to be the very best stewards of their road networks and their taxpayer dollars. And we know that that comes with increased pressure in times like the unprecedented times we're in right now. So uh, rather than speak to you uh, about just the tools in the site and giving you some tools, we wanted you to be able to hear from one of your own. So uh, I'd like to introduce John Livesey. 
John uh, has an incredible case study he's going to share with you about how he's done exactly this, how he's taken the same amount of resources but spent them differently in order to uh, reverse the trend of a deteriorating network, in order to garner um, public approval, public goodwill, satisfy different decision makers, and kind of navigate the pressures uh, that you guys face on a daily basis. And, and uh, we're conscious, we're gonna spend some time at the end talking about, okay, this is how you look to the future. We'll also explore as we go, what are some of the low hanging fruit choices or things that you can do right now today um, if, if you're dealing with just less dollars? How do you make each of those work harder? Uh, so John is a licensed uh, professional engineer um, in Massachusetts. He has spent 26 years in municipal engineering, has his bachelor's in uh, civil engineering, his master's in geotechnical. And for the last um, for the last 10 years, 11 years, he has been the town engineer in the town of Lexington, Massachusetts, where he is responsible for the majority of the DPW's capital outlay, including everything from uh, sewers and sidewalks to stormwater and uh, today where we will be spending most of our time uh, also roads. Uh, John's favorite new COVID hobby is playing the harmonica and his longtime passion is that he is a diehard Bruins fan. So uh, I'm excited to have John Lizzie sharing with us today what he's done uh, in the town of Lexington. And John, if you'll just start with an overview of the network and the project that you've been tackling for 10 years, where are you at today? Sure. Thank you very much, Lindsay. As as luck would have it, as the webinar begins, I have a milling machine driving by my house milling the road. So if you hear a slight humming in the background, that's sound effects for the webinar. Um, I was asked to present a case study, case history of the progress that we've made in Lexington over the last 10 years in our roadway network. Due to our development of a pavement management program and extensive use of pavement preservation techniques that cover all levels of the deterioration curve, we've been able to see significant improvements in our network as a whole. We've been able to improve our PCI from a 68 up to an 85. We've been able to drop our backlog, which is the cost if we were to repair all our roads in a given year, down from seven and a half million from an original number of uh, over 30 million. We, were able, we are able to address about 20 to 25% of our roads in a typical year with some type of treatment. So within a given year, where we have a presence on 20 to 25% of our roads in the network. And the complaints since we started the program have gone down significantly. In fact, our budget um, went from, from a very contentious budget at town meeting to one that's now um, found on the consent agenda where they don't don't does not go to debate. So that's been that's been a nice change. Mm -hmm. So this has been done through utilizing some key tools. We have a strong focus on the roadway network as a whole. Using that network level analysis, we can evaluate multiple funding scenarios to determine what is appropriate for Lexington. We're dedicated to a best first approach. And this keeps us from getting a sole focus on those really bad shape roads that can sometimes paralyze your thoughts and you just really want to go to those ones and stop looking at the network as a whole. We constantly are looking at expanding our toolbox with different roadway treatments so we can use the right treatments for the right roads at the right time. And if any of you have um, taking, taking webinars, seminars, um, or anything like that on pavement preservation or pavement management, you've heard that phrase, right treatments for the right road at the right time. That's a very important statement to keep in mind when you're managing roadways. We stay committed to the plan and we stay committed to the strategy. It's easy to fall back into old habits or old ways, but if we can get everyone on board and it, help, it helps us to remain focused. By everyone, I mean your staff, the politicians and, of course, the residents who ultimately fund the program. So we're going to dive in in more detail. That's an overview, and it's uh, it's such a great case study of what can happen by just spending the same dollars differently. Um, and, and so John's going to unpack that a little bit further as we go. Uh, what we're going to cover today is an approach to whole network health, 
which is something that can be done even in the light and, and is maybe more important than ever even in light of lower resources and increased demands from every dollar we'll talk about best first versus worst first what that means how to make that move uh, some keys to success and then we asked uh, john and some other folks to organize just some advice and questions for navigating this time and communicating with various decision makers uh, so that's where we'll spend some time today we'll also take you to the road resource website and show you a couple tools that that may be particularly relevant for you right now one thing i'll also mention um, if you have any questions as we're going there's a question box on your go to webinar um, uh, window just go ahead and type those there and we'll we'll go through questions at the end so we'll start by uh, knowing your network health how um, if the very first the very first stop in thinking about how to take dollars especially limited dollars and move them further is knowing where you're at and giving yourself something to benchmark against so um, it's in the tagline of, of PPRA, better roads today, stronger networks tomorrow. But the idea is really this one simple concept. How do I move from one road at a time? And how I'm gonna address this road or these particular roads to how do I think about distributing these dollars across my network? Again, this conversation and these choices becoming even more critical uh, if you're dealing with less dollars, how do you how do you look at those stopgap measures and, and how do you make the best choices you can today so that we're not dealing with very severely accelerated deterioration um, over the next couple of years? So, uh, John, I'll ask you to talk a little bit about how you how you made this move and share from your network. OK, in order to develop a payment management program, it's critical to know your roads. You must know what you have across your entire network. This includes, excuse me, an inventory of the roadways, including length, width, and surface type, as well as a thorough understanding of the road distresses, their severities, as well as the extent of those severities. In Lexington, we put aside a small portion of roadway funding when we were starting out, and we hired a consultant to do this town-wide and put it in an asset management software database. We keep the inventory dynamic by updating yearly with both work completed as well as resurveying a third of the network to keep the network up to date at all times. It truly does not need to be that sophisticated, however. Many communities cannot or do not want to dedicate that kind of funding developing the system. In those cases, I would argue that you can develop a similar system on the cheap. Particularly during these COVID-19 times when many are working out of the office, it may be an opportune time to do just that. Length and width measurements can be taken from driving the roads, or in many cases, communities have aerial photos that allow you to simply measure your widths and your lengths right from those photos, which gets you uh, good enough data to, to perform a network level analysis. You can also gather roadway conditions while you're doing it by driving, driving the roadways or walking the roadways. If you're either not comfortable identifying de detailed distresses or simply do not have the time, this can be even further simplified by comparing road condition to the photos that you, um, similar to what you can find on the roadresource.org website. And that, that can give you an approximate pavement condition index, also referred to as PCI, that can help you get an idea of what potential treatments are available for your different road conditions. There's no need to overthink it. A simple inventory is significantly more powerful than no inventory at all. And that can be developed in a simple strategy. Thanks. I'm actually going to take us over to the website right now. This is on roadresource.org. As John mentioned, uh, knowing the, the condition of your network health is a really great way to get your arms around what you're dealing with and the problem as a whole. Um, and, and if you're not exactly sure where to start on evaluating the conditions of your roads, or if you have the time to drive the roads um, these days as everyone is out of the office, um, this is a really great resource to start determining those things. Underneath the treatment toolbox, there's a feature called Explore by Pavement Photos. And what you can do is use this page, which has photos of roads from least distressed to worst distressed. You can compare these with your roads and, and kind of look and guess, well, is that, is that 
that's kind of what my road looks like. I wonder if it's a PCI uh, in the category of C. It gives you a little bit about the number of possibilities or a range of what your road could be, the PCI. Obviously, there's much more that goes into evaluating these uh, on a scientific level. This is a great place to start. This tool also gives you, uh, outlines the primary distress in these photos, uh, which could give you a good place to start for possible solutions and treatments uh, that might be good candidates for your roads. Um, really just a good way to get familiar with um, distress and pavement condition as you're driving through your network. Another tool that we use in, in a similar sense on the same uh, onroadresource.org is the pavement criteria tool. And this can help you evaluate other possible treatment solutions for your roads if you're not sure where to start. You can input things like pavement condition and primary distress, which as we mentioned, can you can uh, determine using that pavement photos tool. And when you input some of these things, uh, the application gives you some suggestions of possible treatments. You can also notice when you highlight down the line, it gives suggestions and indicates where each treatment uh, affects the road cross section itself. So if you're evaluating um, different toolboxes of treatments, this is a great place to start and compare with additional information for each treatment below when you click. Um, so just another tool on the road resource website that can help you when you're looking at evaluating your road network as a whole and sort of um, determining where you are and what you have in the playground to stretch dollars further. John, we're just getting two quick questions here. Um, so first of all, everyone, yes, the slides will be available later and this webinar will be available later to watch on the website. Uh, two questions. John, what payment management software was used by the consultant? And two, what process do you use to determine your PCI? Do you use an empirical process or a computer program? So the our original program that we were using in Lexington was Cotograph. Um, I have used a, a few other proprietary ones in my career. Um, we've switched from Cotograph to um, another one that's called PeopleGIS. And that's, a, that's what we use now. And working with our consultant, um, the, the PCI is actually calculated through the software um, that, that our, cons, our consultant houses for payment management. There are a number of different softwares out there, depending on how many assets you're managing and, and what level of sophistication you're looking for. Um, all of them work similarly um, but some have um, much more uh, much more complicated um, which can provide you a lot more with a lot more different levels of analysis um, so you really need to understand what you're looking for there's also some out there that are um, significantly cheaper and although I haven't looked in a while there were some sharewares out there for a while that you could enter your data and download the programs for free and use that for managing your data as well this they're likely still available um, and I've, I toyed around with those earlier in my career and they seemed like they would do the trick, particularly for a community trying to get started. Thanks, John. And several you're asking other questions that John is about to answer. All right, well, through our inventory collection, we were able to create a GIS map that identified, identified road conditions. And um, for us, we color coded them to just give us some sort of idea when we're looking at the map, what the conditions of our road this map what you, that you see here is the beginning of our payment management program back in 2010. You'll notice a lot of red and a lot of orange. Those are roads that are in the rehabilitation portion of the deterioration curve. Many probably could have been saved with preservation, but we're not. We had a fair amount of roadways in this category, which is better demonstrated on the following slide. This slide provides a pie chart of our 2010 conditions. So you can see the yellow, orange, and red roads on the right side of that pie graph, which amounts to almost 40% of our roadways were in rehab, reclamation, or reconstruction. So they were in the in the bad part of the curve. Uh, part of the curve we didn't want to we didn't want to get in. Uh, with that said, we also did have um, just about 60% of them in the maintenance. And preventative maintenance category and the do nothing category. Um, so those are roads that we really wanted to make sure we, we kept in, in that area. 
with this, we're able to quantify our backlog, which was over 30, over $30 million worth of repairs if we were going to do all the repairs in one year. Next. So we knew the current plant couldn't get us there, but what would? How would we gain ground? How would we change our current practice and progress on our roadway network? So if you, I think John's point about knowing the condition of your network, even if you start small, a third of a year each year, that's critical to know if you are gaining ground or losing ground and to go into that. How do you go into each year knowing that the treatment choices that you make with that year's treatment plan, especially if, again, if you're looking at less dollars, are going to gain more ground as opposed to less ground. So we're going to talk quickly about remaining service life, which is an important concept for um, measuring that impact of a treatment plan on your, on your overall network health. Uh, and so here's the concept, very simply, each year a single lane mile loses a year of its remaining life, bringing it closer to failure. So every lane mile in your network loses one lane mile year of life annually. That means that a network with 500 lane miles loses 500 lane mile years of life every year. And therefore, if your treatment plan doesn't add at least 500 mile years of life to the network, the network will slowly lose ground. This is why we see across America, across many communities, those trends towards slowly deteriorating networks over time. So understanding the curve, how do you move from, um, how, do you, how do you approach the curve thinking about how you can spend dollars at the right point of a road's life cycle or deterioration cycle uh, to, to distribute those dollars across the network and make the overall network improve, not just one road or the other. So we knew we had to change the way our roads were managed and we needed to pay more attention to the preservation as well as the remaining service life of our network. I'm sure many of you, if not most of you, have seen this deterioration curve or something similar in the past. And this demonstrates how a typical road deteriorates and how quickly the cost goes up as it deteriorates. You'll notice that in the vicinity of the 10 year mark, the deterioration accelerates as does the cost per square yard of repair and more important, the equivalent annual cost, which is in a nutshell, is the life added per dollar spent. We needed to keep our roadways from falling into the extremely expensive area of the curve demonstrated by the lower bands of this graph. Our focus needed to be on the upper bands and work on the lower cost roadways uh, so that we could extend the life and not, get, not have to work on the lower cost roadways. We could keep them from falling into that band. We're chasing our tail with the method of just atta attacking the worst roads. And I just want to add one thing that to a previous slide, often when people are looking at the budgets on, can I afford to put together a payment management program? Can I put this cost out there? Um, simply put, if you make the right decision on one roadway versus the wrong decision, and it can add you just one year of life or two years of life to that roadway, you probably paid for the program just with that decision alone. So yeah. it's absolutely worthwhile going forward with payment management. You'll save that money just it, just in one decision, never mind network wide decisions. John, how many lane miles are in your network? We have 268 lane miles, so 134 miles of road. Is is we don't have a lot of. Um, Multi-lane roads, usually it's one lane in each direction. We only have a few short sections that are that okay. are more than that. So thank you. Yeah. So if you remember in 2010, we had roads spread all across the curve with a big portion in the red, orange, and yellow. But we knew one thing. Next. 
those significantly deteriorated roads would stay deteriorated. The value had already been lost and we're not going to save those roads. We already lost those roads. The same wasn't said for our good roads. I like to, when I speak to residents, sometimes I, sometimes I talk to them um, as if they had a fleet of vehicles and they were short on money and they had a choice of changing the oil in all their vehicles on a regular basis or leaving that oil and letting some of them run dry on oil and just changing the engine of the one that, that seized. And if you do that, eventually all your engines are going to seize. Similar with roads, if you just focus on that worst road, eventually all your roads are going to be in that category. And it's going to cost you a lot more money to get there as well. So if, if we did have to fully rehab or rebuild a road, we wanted to make sure we kept it from following back to that condition. So we need to remain diligent if we wanted to make headway on improving our network. We needed to ultimately extend the lives of our roads. Instead of a road lasting 15, 20, 25 years, we wanted to see if we could look at it to last 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years. So we need to get away. In order to do that, we have to get away from the worst current mindset and get ourselves into a best current mindset. I'd been trained that way from my first supervisor, who was my mentor, as well as through the Bay State Roads Technology Transfer Program, which is an excellent training program that we're fortunate enough to have in Massachusetts. I had been heavily involved in a best first management approach from our previous community as well, and that worked out great, and we saw um, incredible improvements to that network. So it was time for us to implement this in my company. Mm -hmm. So with the data clear, Collected, we were able to project a numerous different budget scenarios over a 10 year period. So we started off with a zero funding scenario. What would happen if we had no funding for the roadways? Where would they be in 10 years? So it's a um, pretty dramatic failure, actually. We, it showed we'd go from a 68 to a 28 in 10 years if we did absolutely nothing. So then we looked at, okay, what's our historical budget? What have we been getting? And what if we keep using, what if we just keep that budget? If we kept that budget and stuck with our worst first approach, then our PCI would go from 68 to 40. So again, pretty significant decline by improper management. Um, what was nice to see is that we, if we change our methodology and manage the roads correctly, we could at least keep them in that current condition of a, of a 68. So a status quo. So that was that was reassuring that we could at least keep what we had in that condition by doing our job properly. Mm -hmm. um, but 68 is not what we wanted to provide our residents as a level of service. We looked at a number of different roads and different payment conditions and decided from the engineering staff level that our goal was going to be an 85, and that's what we were going to try to convince the board of selectmen to fund. That was our aggressive funding scenario. We presented those to the Board of Selectmen along with our recommendation to get the roads to the mid 80s and hold them there. And ultimately it was approved. Um, the funding didn't arrive for a few years later. Part of that was um, just the time it took to convince the, the politicians and the leaders that voted for the money and also a typical municipal budget cycle, which just takes a while to get there. Mm -hmm. So in order to make this happen, we needed a full box of treatments. Um, our toolbox at that point was crack seal, mill and overlay, and reclaim grade and pave. That's all we had in our toolbox and crack sealing specifically was actually pretty sparse, although we did it, we did it on a very limited basis at that point. So at this point, we had to embark on a large scale investigation to see what other treatments people were using, see what other treatments may be available to us. We physically traveled around the state to see different applications being placed um, in products that were you know, fairly new, a year or two old. Um, being an ultimate skeptic, I wanted to see things that had been in place for much longer than a year or two. Uh, most products after a year look pretty good, although not all, most do. So I wanted to see stuff that was a little older, four, five, six, seven um, products that were at the end of what we would be considered a useful life. So we began looking at treatments that have been down for five plus years. We also reached out to colleagues that we knew were strong roadway managers and that have used multiple treatments. 
That allowed us to expand our toolbox to products they were willing, we were willing to try. Additionally, we reevaluated the equivalent annual cost for these treatments to truth out the benefit. Early in my career, I had done the same for various treatments. And at that point, when the cost per ton in place was actually, if it might be showing my age, was actually below $20 per ton for in-place asphalt, the equivalent annual cost for these treatments didn't make sense to me. Um, but since then, the cost for in-place asphalt has dramatically increased three to four times that cost, and we haven't seen that same increase with the preservations. So once I reevaluated it, it made it clear that the benefits were, were there and it was significant, and we needed to implement these into our toolbox. John, will you just quickly speak to um, when I hear agencies who are embarking on this journey, uh, the challenge is often speaking to different decision makers, right? So you have mm -hmm. your uh, councilman or your selectman or your mayor or whoever your whoever your higher up kind of money people or politicians are. You also have your engineering departments, your taxpayers. I'm curious about making some of these moves. How did you communicate with those different groups or who was maybe the toughest to um, the toughest to to get aligned with this new philosophy of of working? Okay, well, the, the Board of Selectmen, once we presented best for us versus worst for us, was actually pretty easy to convince. It was just a matter of them determining how to get us the funding. Um, I had younger staff that were um, eager and willing to learn, so they went along pretty quickly. Um, for me, in my case, the hardest one to convince was myself. Mm. For most of my career, I had done mill and paving. I had done roadway reclamation grade and paving, and I, I knew it very well. I knew how to put together specs. I knew how to inspect it and ensure quality control. I was comfortable with it, um, and I knew what the results were going to be. So embarking on in this new territory, not fully understanding the life of it because I've never put it down, put these different treatments down, was something I had to truly convince myself. So in this particular case, for my scenario, I was the hardest one to convince. It took me a few years to get there. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, and so, I'll just go. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, good. So, just to get quickly, this, the treatments that we um, did take on were um, we first we rolled out double micro. Um, we wanted to go slow because we weren't sure what the different treatments were. So, we rolled that out the first year. Um, the second year, we added in a few other treatments. We added in cape seals and fog seals. By year three, we were pretty much large scale on all those treatments, doing a tremendous amount of it. Then on year four, we added in cold in place. In year five, we actually started trying a different fog seal. So we were comparing two different fog seals side by side. So we're constantly evaluating treatments and expanding the toolbox as appropriate. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. And I'll add too, on, on the Road Resource website, um, as John mentioned, one of the best things you can do is get out there and get familiar with newer treatments. Um, in this case, there may be uh, less traveling. You might have a harder time getting to your neighboring counties and seeing the work that's uh, being done. The Cre Treatment Resource Center is a great asset to you at this point. Um, Onroadresource.org, you can find it on the homepage here in the blue bar or under the treatment toolbox. This is a place where we have 18 different treatments with consistent menus of information that include everything from basic summaries, which can be useful in communicating with um, new staff members, communicating with the public, um, with elected officials, um, to benefits, uh, including cost, environmental, uh, recycling and materials saving, return to traffic, um, and then also network benefits. Um, issues addressed and attributes and common combinations. So this is a great overview page, um, but the entire menu digs into um, many different questions that you might have about a new treatment, including process and variations. Um, and each treatment resource center includes these rules of thumb. We took a moment with each treatment and asked the experts in the industry, um, if you were sitting across the table from somebody who was about to try this treatment, Knowing your years of experience in history, what would you recommend that they keep an eye out for or consider or think about as they're applying these treatments? So 
some of those rules of thumb that um, uh, are, are more difficult to get sometimes in those uh, longer publications. You can see right. expect oh, go ahead. Uh, expectations of each treatment. What can you expect when you're applying a new treatment? Um, and all of these different uh, areas from pre-construction, construction to quality assurance, uh, including articles on research and performance for various treatments and success stories. This is what John was talking about, going out and visiting other communities who are applying, applying these treatments and seeing success. In many cases, you'll find stories uh, near your network um, and learn about how these different um, uh, communities are using these treatments. So it's a great way to kind of supplement for what John's talking about and do your research from home, uh, even while you might be uh, confined to the office or to home. Uh, Grace, would you please navigate? We're getting some questions about the cost per treatment. So while you're on the website, will you just quickly take them to uh, the equivalent annualized cost calculator and show people where they can take a look at this? The challenge is that we recognize that costs are, are so variable by region, uh, but this, um, this is a tool on the site that allows you to compare the equivalent annualized cost, which is the cost of that treatment divided by the life extension it provides of various treatments. Uh, and what you'll notice is um, each of those fields can be adjusted uh, to reflect the cost. These are national averages. They can be adjusted to reflect the cost in your area. And in the top right-hand corner of the website, uh, if you want to create a profile, if you log in and create a profile, it's free. You're the only one who ever sees the data. It allows you to repopulate the tools on the site with the costs and the life extension that you experience in your area. Um, and John, I wanna make sure we can get back to where you are today. But as we get back to the slides, uh, would you mind just quickly, people are asking uh, a few questions about what your annual paving budget is um, and if you have a specific resurfacing budget within that. Okay, our current paving budget for the town is at $3.5 million. Some of that money, about a third of that money comes from the state and the rest is locally funded. Um, that was our aggressive scenario that we've been doing for about eight years now. And we, so we don't have a specific dollar amount or specific percentage assigned to the road i believe you said the road reconstruction jobs the overlay jobs um we, we evaluate every year and as you'll see further down in the presentation a calculator that we do to see what the, the life extension is of our roadways and we use that to help make sure we have a positive impact from our roadway network and it helps us decide how many of those we can do while preserving the roads that are in good shape. So you'll see that that'll be answered later on in the presentation. Thanks, John. All right, so um, where are we today? So we talked about where we were and what we were trying to do. And so 10 years in from the original analysis, you'll see the two maps. So one on the left is 2010, the one on the right is 2020. You'll see that the change of management and the increased funding has made drastic improvements. Um, this is actually, although it's 10 year difference between the maps, it's only eight years difference between the funding change. So the one on the right, as you see a lot more blues, light blues and greens. Those are, those are roads in very good condition and, and a lot less red, a lot less orange on those. Um, we've grown to hate those colors in a pavement management um, sense. So um, significant improvements. And I'll go back to that eye chart as well in the next few slides to show you um, the percentages. So um, if you can recall, these were our 2010 conditions. And then uh, 2020 conditions show the increase to an 85. Um, a few points of note here, you can see the significant difference in the pie sizes. So the work in the preventative maintenance band positively increased from 61% up to 85%. So 85% of our roads are in either the preventative maintenance band or actually the do nothing band. So that's a significant change. And the work in the rehab and reconstruction band has decreased from 39% down to 15%. So with only 7% of those in the point that they need of reclamation or reconstruction. 
So it's made a significant impact in, in that eight year period. It has been noticed. I have people approach me at different meetings um, that we have in town, policemen, firemen, residents saying, wow, the roads are incredible. How are you doing it? So um, um, with, without asking, people are commenting on it, which is unusual in, in my business, so in our business. <laughs> Usually it's just complaints when you're doing things wrong. So that's nice to hear. Yeah. So next. So our backlog is also now down to a very manageable number. It's down to um, it's down to seven and a half million uh, total backlog, which actually is more than covered in two years of funding. So um, which is amazing that we're that with two years of funding, we could actually cover that entire backlog. Close to the deterioration during that period as well, um, but to get down to that point is huge. Every year we're looking at our trending. How's that backlog trending? How's that PCI trending? So those are two of the things that we always want to see: is that we trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So um, the speed of the trend is depends on the commitment of the community, but at least trending in the right direction is where you want to go. So our best first mantra is working. Um, our remaining work is weighed heavily into the preservation categories, which are significant lo significantly lower in cost, so we can get actually more and more road work done, more and more miles of road work done, because the road work we have is is in those um, lower cost areas in the lower cost benefit value area as well. Next. And we continue to do our forecast modeling every year. Um, we provide that to our funding groups, our selectmen. For us, we have a capital committee that uh, that advises our town meeting, which is our budget voting board in our town. And this forecast model, we again look at various different scenarios. What do we need for funding to stay status quo? Um, and what do we need to, for funding to continue to improve? And we're now demonstrating that we can actually positively trend our PCI with 2.3 million per year down significantly from the three and a half million per year that we've been getting. So we've actually in our last budget meeting, I've informed our town manager that we can reduce the budget by over a million if they'd like to. Um, they get in such positive response on our road work that he, he told us to, that he wants to continue with the funding we're getting, which is nice to hear. Um, but knowing that if we have a drop in funding, we're still projecting positively is um, is a very exciting place to be. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who are curious, the RSR is is very similar, very comparable to PCI. It's just what his current system is using. If anything, PCI may reflect just a couple points higher than RSR. Correct, John? Yes. PCI is payment condition in index. RSR is roadway surface rating. They're essentially the same same thing. It's just more of a terminology thing from from a change of management system. Thanks. So let's talk down a little bit about uh, keys to success and what drove some of this. Because uh, the results, I think it's it's really an impressive example of what can happen when you look at each annual treatment plan as kind of one step towards broader network improvement. Uh, but tell us a little bit about some of what it took to get there. Sure. So keys to success, traffic control, communication, and education are key to ensuring that we implement the program right. We have the right philosophy and we implement it. So with the traffic control piece, um, we need to make sure that, that the public um, can handle this amount of work going on in town because we are you know, hitting 20 to 25 percent of the network, we're everywhere with crews. Um, with that said, most of the techniques move quite quickly, so you're in there and out of there really quickly. So, um, but detour signs are important. Not just having a detour sign telling people you can't go this way and you must go left. The detour needs to really bring them through the entire route. Don't assume people know how to get to where they're going. Um, the more detour signs, the better the communication is, and the less frustration there is from drivers. I, we were amazed at how many people we find that have lived in the same house for 25 years in the neighborhood, but only know one way to get to that house. So those detours have helped significantly. 
Also, policemen, police details are flagmen in, in Massachusetts. We're required to use police details, not flagmen. Um, but it's important to have, um, it's better to have too many than not enough so they can also ensure that the, not only the work is protected, but the public is safe, the workers are safe, and the people um, follow, follow the proper detour routes and stay off the construction job. We also, um, we hire a lot of interns in town. So on the real heavy preservation days, although our intern trends tend to be focused on stormwater, there's usually a few weeks a year that we, we have them standing at intersections or particular driveways during preservation techniques to um, help communicate with the residents and help protect the work that's going down and get people to their destinations at the same time. Um, performing the work one lane at a time is important to allowing that lane to cure before before other people get onto that road. Um, if you get both lanes down and you're trapping 50 people in their driveways, you can get some really frustrated residents. So it's, there are times that we have to do one lane of a road, move to another road and do a lane on that one and then come back or even stop the crew and tell the crew they need to wait for 20, 30 minutes so it sets up before they can move on. Unfortunately, in Massachusetts, we have a couple of excellent vendors for pavement preservation um, and they are very willing to do that. They understand the importance of that. And so it hasn't been an issue with, with our contractors. We don't have a lot of vendors, but the ones we have are very good at. So we have signs on cones in the middle of the street. We do a lot of small foam core signs. So people, once they get past once they get past the crew, they don't jump back over into the lane that's still curing. So those foam core signs now are pretty cheap. So we're around the same line with cones with small signs on it that will help. And then under this COVID-19 safety protocol, we find it even more important to have clear traffic management, especially now that we're trying to minimize person-to-person -person interaction. If people need to stop and call you over to the car so you can talk to them through the window and explain to them how to get around, that's not helping with the, with that safety protocol. So signage is even more critical during these times. So um, education is another critical component. So for our staff, um, staff education and training is critical to ensure proper buy-in from the staff. That includes internal trainings, your staff to staff trainings, webinars, seminars, um, websites are good. This, I wish this website that you guys had was available 10 years ago. It saved me a tremendous amount of time and a lot of driving around Massachusetts. Um, speaking with colleagues is great too. Um, seeing what they're doing, it's also a good way to, to find out what the costs are in your region in trade journals. All, managing, um, all of the managing department staff should at least understand payment management philosophy and what payment preservation techniques there are so they can answer, answer general phone calls that make them into the office. Mm -hmm. um, political leader education is critical so that they understand the methods of the madness, why you're doing it. So we provide a yearly report and a presentation to our political leaders every year to help educate them. That also provides them the knowledge to answer calls that they may get from their constituents. And then the public in education is provided through published information on our website and more importantly through mailers. And what you see here, I don't expect you to read this, I'm gonna go over in general what's on it, um, is a mailer that we send out. It's 11 by 17 two-sided mailer. The back side is a map of the roads we're working on. On the left side, it's a general description of the project, what the people can expect regarding construction. This gets mailed out to everybody that abuts a project or we think is close enough to be impacted by it. It lets them know that they'll be limited parking, how they can best reach us, communicate us, and what to expect from us for communication um, and why we're doing this work. And on the right side, there's actually a description of all of the treatments that we use. Most people know what an overlay is, so um, you know that's they've seen that for years. But if they find out their roads are getting a cape sale, they have no idea what we're doing. So on the right side, it explains to them what a cape sale is. It also explains to them that there's going to be a chip seal followed by a microsurface. So they know that those stones that are loose are going to be covered up in a couple of weeks. So we go door to door with notices um, a day or two before the application so they understand the limitations of access, times of work, 
where to park and to shut off the sprinklers. Um, we put a message on Twitter for those that follow our Twitter account that lets um, the general public know about closures and detours, updates on our website, um, message boards on the street for anyone not reached on those communications. We send an email to the key users such as police and fire and EMS as well as any transit um, users and refuse collection that may be using the road. And currently we're in the process of adapting our mailer with adjusted communication methods due to COVID-19. Door-to-door handouts um, may need to cease temporarily. We don't want to grab a thousand house door handles and they don't want us grabbing their door handles right now. Um, so we're making adjustments to that. We may need to do a lot more um, on our website. We may need to implement more email communication than typical and even offer web conferencing for any, any of those face-to-face -face meetings that you need to have with certain residents who have particular concerns. So this yeah. is another evolving challenge and we're adjusting as we go on that. Thanks. One of the great tools that you can look at, I mean, think about the amount of communication that's involved in creating buy-in from all across the different um, audiences from the public to elected officials, even to your internal staff. One of the most important things to sticking to a plan is not um, not getting unforeseen hurdles from uh, naysayers down the road. So that education is critical. So one way that we evaluate our plan on an annual basis before we actually roll it out to construction is through the remaining service life. And that's the one I said we'd touch on later. This is the later. Um, and we, we calculate the remaining service life based on our proposed plan. And that helps us define where we can put the money and make sure we're, we're net positive every year. So um, every year we use the road resource website to do a calculation. And this past year we were net positive 67. So essentially it's showing that our roads are getting younger in town and that's our goal each year. <laughs> And this is a demonstration example. This is an, an example from uh, John's network, but we wanted to walk you through how to use the remaining service life calculator, especially if you're in a situation where you're facing decreased budgets this year. Um, this is an extreme example, but demonstrative of how the concept of remaining service life can be used. Um, in this example, we have uh, a network with 200 lane miles, average uh, lane width of 12 feet, and you're getting about a million dollars per year, or they're consistent, that's their consistent budget. They're spending all of it using this plan, um, using doing two miles of remove and replace this year, two miles of major mill and fill, uh, two and a half miles of minor mill and fill, and 13 miles of crack seal. You can see how this all breaks down at the network level when we break it into which preservation treatments which rehabilitation treatments and which reconstruction treatments they're using. Eventually, when you calculate all of that up, the added lane mile years of life are actually contributing to a deteriorating network. Essentially, this pavement management plan is not adding enough life to catch up or to run the race faster than their roads are deteriorating. So, so we took a look at what might happen if this particular plan's budget got slashed. Um, we'll go with slashed in half. So they're getting $500,000 this year instead of a million. And there are ways that you can adjust and pivot your plan. Of course, you have to take in consideration lots of real life factors like which roads are candidates for which treatments. Um, but when you tend to shift those, those treatments at the bottom of the curve, um, from reconstruction, rehabilitation to recycling treatments uh, tends to free up your budget to then shift other, other dollars up towards the top of the curve to preserve your roads that are already in good shape for less money um, and, and eventually heal your network as you go. So in this case, um, instead of doing these two uh, miles of full depth remove and replace this year, we might put that off for another year. Again, that road will likely need the same treatment down the line. We might shift this major mill and fill to a cold recycle with a double chip on top. We might take this minor mill and fill and make it a cape seal. Uh, and instead of two and a half miles, in this case, we're going to do two, find a way to kind of repurpose. 
we're going to double our crack seal plan for this year and then add chip seal to the plan. We're going to do 13 miles of chip seal. So you can see we've spent most of our budget. The calculator calculates your remaining budget as you go. It calculates your lane mile years based on your life extension. And the unit costs, as Lindsay, Lindsay mentioned, are auto populated. Currently, they're using the average, the national averages, um, but you can input your own numbers in the back end. Anyway, when you reorient your plan, even using half the budget, in this case, by shifting more towards preservation, we were able to add five lane mile years of life this year and address 22% of our roads. We're starting to reverse that trend of the deteriorating network and instead beginning to gain ground and make progress. Um, John's story is a 10 year long story and it is an iterative process. Each year you get better and better. And as he said, each year they're evaluating their remaining service life contributions of every annual treatment plan. Um, so this is a great tool. The remaining service life calculator can be found underneath network optimization on the website. And if you're not familiar with the concept, you can learn a little bit about it under about or try it out yourself using the calculator application. Once you're done, you can export this information and save it to, well, it's, it's not showing me because we're presenting, but you can save it to an Excel document as you go. So we will um, wrap with just a little bit um, more intel about kind of advice for you guys during this time. Uh, we've organized insight from um, different webinars around the country and uh, kind of regrouped with John and other folks to say, okay, what are you experiencing and, and what do you do right now today? I'm also conscious there's quite a few questions on um, the on the webinar. I will uh, organize all of them. Um, we'll probably keep you guys who want to stay five to seven minutes over to answer as many as we can, and then we'll uh, organize some answers and send them out afterwards. Uh, we're also, for any of you who are gonna be dropping off, we're gonna be sending you a poll asking, is there anything else that you really want to know about right now during COVID uh, that PPRA can provide you? If so, we'll look at organizing uh, another webinar. So please pay attention to your emails. Take just a moment to share that survey with us and we'll make sure the answers to questions we missed today um, get answered there. Um, so before we wrap, John, um, where do you start if you are, so what's great about this is it's an incredible before and after. However, um, if I haven't been doing this, if I'm an agency, I've been doing this for 10 years, and now I'm looking at less money, where do I start or what are a few things that like I must do today or a few kind of most important things to consider? So if, if you have less money, if your budget's being, being cut um, or even just not increased, that's the best time to perform preservation. Um, the less you have, the more critical it is to really stretch your dollars and make sure that the better condition roads just do not slip. Um, it also shows a greater presence. Um, and by presence, I mean that you're out there working on more roads and that tends to spark more support for your program for future funding requests. Okay. Well, um, I'm curious, uh, John, will you, will you always spend money up the curve on the top of the curve right now with preservation um like some of the recycling treatments are those options during this time or how do you think about recycling when you have limited dollars yeah this um limited dollars uh, i will always focus on preservation um but there's there's always those roads that you just know you have to get to um, the road could be in really bad shape and it could just have a really high ADP, so you just need to get to it. Uh, for whatever other reason, it's a road that you need to do. Um, you know, although we focus on best first, we don't even completely ignore all the roads in bad shapes. We over in bad shape, but over time we try to bring those up. So when you're looking at recycling techniques, there's ways that you may be able to um, do those and still save money. So instead of your reclamation where you're reclaiming, grading, and paving. Um, I would suggest you look into cold in place recycling, which is, um, it saves you money, but it adds a, um, a, a very similar uh, 
amount of life. Some would actually argue that adds more life than a reclamation. So if your proposed reclaim is in the kind of condition that it could accept a cold in place, then you may want to evaluate a treatment like that, which is a very, very good treatment. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you about what you have tried that has really resonated with officials in light of the context today, but I, I feel like you've kind of answered that. Is there anything that you would add? Um, I would add stick to the plan, stay focused on the network. It's very easy to get pulled off onto that one road that someone's calling about, uh, those four or five or 10 or 15 really bad roads and lose, lose focus on your plan. If you do get to one of those roads and you bring it up to a great condition, keep it there. Mm -hmm. You should be working on that road again in three years with a fog sale. Uh, maybe another fog sale three years after that, maybe four or five years after that, you, you'll be putting a microsurface on. Mm -hmm. Extend that life, make that 20 year road into a 40 year road. Okay. That's the focus. Thank you. We've organized one more slide and then I'm gonna hit up um, a, about five minutes worth of questions if you have the extra time, John. Sure. This is uh, some truths that resonate with non-road people. So we know that many of you are speaking to either taxpayers or to electeds or people with uh, who are making budgetary decisions who don't have the benefit of understanding how this sort of approach to road maintenance, maintenance works. Um, and this slide just covers some things that really resonate with those groups, right? The economic impact that roads have on businesses, uh, the impact to drivers, 130 billion annually, or on average, $600 per driver per year of deteriorated roads. That's what it costs your traveling public, your taxpayers. Uh, the fact that deferred maintenance, um, if your budgets get slashed now, it's going to cost you more next year to maintain the same road than it will if you get ahead of it this year. So a failure to invest in roads now is going to give us a bigger problem down the line. Uh, construction projects create jobs. Um, and, and as John said, one of the things I found really compelling about his story was, look, we know none of you guys get thanked enough for the work that you do. And most frequently the phone's ringing when there's a complaint. And uh, by touching more of the roads, earlier you're actually um, connecting with your public in greater degrees there's also some resources on the website for taxpayer communication that allow you to kind of say okay here's what we're doing with preservation and recycling and help break it down into layman's terms for them um, so we'll include some links to that as well john i'm gonna um switch gears here and just spend a few minutes answering um or asking some questions that people have answered um, one question is, um, as you changed your approach, um, people are asking a little bit about contractors coming with you. Um, they wanna know, so as you've changed your approach, did contractors have to adopt new treatments? They wanna know, do you do the work yourself? Um, and they're curious, is it a multi-year procurement process for pavement preservation treatments? Can you quickly hit those three things? Okay, so we don't self-perform the work. We do self-perform the oversight of the work and the contracting of the work. We tend to, um, we essentially have two bids that go out. One is for pavement preservation, which covers all um, the fog sales, the chip sales, the crack sales, um, the cold in place, the cape sales, and the micros. And that goes out and we have there's essentially for our area there's two vendors that that would that would bid on it um and we did that as a three-year contract so we can extend we have the opportunity to extend that two additional years beyond the first year and we do the same for the for our um what we call our traditional work which is our mill and paving and our reclamation we'll bid that out as its own contract um so we ultimately have two um, two roadway contracts, a preservation contract and a traditional paving contract. And that one will bid as a three year contract too. That has, that's a, um, we have a lot more vendors that bid that particular contract, um, uh, but that's what we end up with. Um, a question, people wanna know, uh, did, did the progress on your network happen incrementally? Um, each year or did it was it more like a j curve was it sort of exponential and there was this 
point where you had accelerated gains? Um, you know, it's a great question, and I have not plotted that graph, but now I really want to. <laughs> <laughs> now I really want to see it. Yeah, we, we, we look at it. Um, we do look at it every year, and every year it, the PCI has trended positively each year. So it's, it's okay. gained every year going in. We we actually warned the selectmen and town meeting members. Um, they said, you know, don't look at it every year. It could go down a year, but go up after that as long as we follow the program. But it never did do that. It kept trending, kept trending positively. Um, I feel like it. Um, I feel like it was fairly linear, but it may pro be progressing quicker now than it was in the earlier stages. Uh huh. But I haven't graphed um, that, but I will be. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I want. I want to see it now too, John. Uh, there's quite a few questions about the website and where to find certain sections on the website. So we'll include links to that in what we send out afterwards. Um, and John, maybe just one more question for you. Uh, people are asking if you changed your approach to anything in light of COVID. Has that caused you to change any of the treatments that you're doing um, or, or how has that kind of affected your current approach? It has not changed any of the treatments that we're putting in place. It has changed our um, our communication methods, and it has delayed um, the start of our program. Typically, uh, in this area in Massachusetts, we start around April 15th. For us in Lexington, we wait till the day after Patriots Day, as being the where the shot heard around the world was. Patriots Day is a big day, so we don't want to start any work before that. Um, so, but this year we're delaying it a little bit, waiting to, waiting for that um, COVID curve to bend down in Massachusetts before we get out there. Um, we're currently collecting HASP plans from all our contractors, but have delayed the start of the work. Okay. Uh, John, there's a lot of people here. Uh, I know you can't see it right now, but there's a lot of people just thanking you for your time uh, and for sharing your insight. We really appreciate it too. Um, and I, I see a lot of very specific questions about treatments that you can find answers to on the Treatment Resource Center that Grace navigated to earlier. Uh, and they're asking a few specific questions that we'll forward to John and see if we can't get some of you guys uh, these answers a little bit later. I know we had over 300 people join us from all over North America today. Uh, so clearly this is top of mind for you guys. Remember to pay attention to your emails for a link asking if there's other information that you'd like for us to curate for you that would be particularly relevant during this time. And we'll close with what we opened with, and that is just, again, thank you for being out there. Thank you for the work that you guys do day in and day out to keep our communities moving. Thank you. Thanks, John, for joining us. Thanks, everyone.